Now, I want you to notice that Mary, it said she got the good part. But you know what it says about Martha? She was anxious and troubled. So my question today is, if you are anxious and you are troubled, what is the standard of your Christianity that you're living by? Is it in your works? Is it in your prayer? Is it in your worship? Is it in your tithing? Is it in your serving? These are all great things, but they were never created to take the place of spending time in your Bible alone and learning to draw from that Word of God into those areas of your life. Because I would, I would dare to say that anybody in this room that is dealing with any lack in any area of your life, it's in direct proportion to how much Word you know in that area. Hallelujah. Good morning. <clears throat> How's everybody doing? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Father, for our time together today. And Lord, I'm asking you, Lord, to open up our ears, open up our hearts, open up our eyes, Lord, and let us truly see you for who you really are. Thank you, Lord, for the glory of your presence in this place today. Father, we declare that this atmosphere is charged with the Holy Spirit and with faith. We declare, Father, that there's enough faith in this room to bring about any change that anybody needs in their life. We thank you, Father, that we're not lacking or missing anything. Father, the puzzle's been completed. We already have the answers before the questions are even answered or asked. But we thank you that today you have put us exactly where we need to be to hear exactly what we need to hear and that we're going to do what the Bible says. We're going to take our faith and we're going to mix it with what we hear, and it will profit us <clears throat> in Jesus' mighty name. Amen? Amen? Amen. Well, I'm Pastor Jack C. Hello, Pastor Jack C. How are you? I'm fine. It has been quite a while since I've been up here, and that's not because they haven't asked. It's that Michelle and I, when we got into redoing the children's wing, we had no idea it was like the Southwest Freeway that it was a job for life, that it was just going to keep going and going and going. And uh, we had Christmas and we had a lot of projects in December. And uh, so if you hear about 20 different sermons today, then I just need you to bear with me. Just take the part that's applicable to you. Amen? Because we might go a lot of different places. What I want to talk about today is I want to talk about the Word of God as being the standard for our life. Amen? The Word of God is being the standard of our life. Let me ask you this. Is everyone in this room experiencing the fullness of God in every area of your life right now? How about in some areas? Yeah? But not anybody in the room. Is anybody in the room living in the fullness of the manifestation of everything that God has for you in your life today? No. Okay. Well, there's a reason why. Have you ever wondered, Lord, why isn't this working for me? Come on. I think the first thing we have to do is be honest. Amen? Uh, God did not, um, he never intended us to be these brain dead zombies that just keep going and going and going. There still has to be levels of manifestation and truth and those types of things. Amen? Yes, we walk by faith. But we should be seeing some manifestation in our life also. Amen. Amen? And I think God wants us to. Have you ever thought, I go to church, I tithe, I help faithfully, I worship, and I pray. But yet I deal with frustration of not seeing the manifestation in my life consistently. Let's be honest. Amen? I think that's all of us at different times. Amen? So I am so glad God gave us the Bible. Let's go to the book of Luke. And this spoke volumes to me. Luke chapter 10. 
verses 38 through 42. And it said, Now it came to pass as they went that he, meaning Jesus, entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving, and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister has left me alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, there are careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. Mary has taken the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. See, Mary, when she knew Jesus was coming to the house, she dropped everything and she sat at his feet and she listened. Martha went into a performance mode. She wanted to see, let's just see how much I can work so then Jesus will know that I really, really care. Now, let's be honest. We need a little bit of both, don't we? Jesus is coming to your house. You're going to definitely push everything into that drawer that has all that stuff in it and push everything into that one bedroom that nobody ever goes in, right? The thing that spoke to me the loudest about this is that they both held a different standard to what was important. Mary said, Jesus is coming to my house today. I'm going to drop everything and I'm going to sit at his feet and I'm going to listen. Martha said... I'm going to work as hard as I possibly can for Jesus and I'm going to make sure that he knows that I have worked so hard that I'm even going to go in during the meeting and interrupt it and say, excuse me, Jesus, can you ask Mary to stop working to come in here and start helping me? See, Jesus can walk into your house and you can be totally oblivious that he's even there because what we start doing Instead of listening to what Jesus has to say, we go into doing all those things that we thought was the standard for Christianity. We begin to work for Jesus. Well, I'm going to pray more. I'm going to worship more. I'm going to give more. I'm going to serve more. And really, all Jesus ever wanted from us was us to sit at his feet and listen to his teaching. Now, I want you to notice that Mary, it said she got the good part. But you know what it says about Martha? She was anxious and troubled. So my question today is, if you are anxious and you are troubled, what is the standard of your Christianity that you're living by? Is it in your works? Is it in your prayer? Is it in your worship? Is it in your tithing? Is it in your serving? These are all great things, but they were never created to take the place of spending time in your Bible alone and learning to draw from that Word of God into those areas of your life. Because I would, I would dare to say that anybody in this room that is dealing with any lack in any area of your life, it's in direct proportion to how much Word you know in that area. Can we be honest this morning? See, I love church. I love worship. I love prayer. I love all those things, but they were never, those were not the standard for us to live by as Christians. The number one most important thing for us to do as a believer is to read and know Jesus through the Word of God. That's where the power is, and that's why there has been such an onslaught have you ever noticed when you sat down to read your Bible, how about 50 other things will pop up? Happened to me this morning. I came early. I want to read it. I want to pray. I want to get ready. But there were 20 different things that happened. We had to move rooms around. See, we got busy in our working for Jesus that we became anxious and troubled. And really all Jesus was saying this morning was, come, sit at my feet. Spend time in my word. Get to know me. See, all of this is related to our faith. You can't put faith in your faith. I'm going to say that again. You can't put faith in your faith. You can only put faith in the Word of God. 
I can talk to you about faith all day long, but until you go into the Word for yourself and find out what the Bible really has to say about a situation, there's no, op- there's no faith. Now, I'm glad that you listen to us and you believe us and you trust us, but you need to check out everything that we say. That's how cults get started, guys. It's because people blind, blindly follow people because of they're charismatic or, or they're, they're loud or they're, they're whatever. And that was never the standard that God ever intended for us to have. Can you say amen? See, Mary put the word first, and the Bible says she got the good portion. Martha put working for Jesus first, and she was anxious and troubled. Both women were in the same house with Jesus. One was experiencing his best, and the other was anxious and nervous. So Jesus could walk into this church right now, And some would experience his best, and some would still be anxious and worried. Because you set a different standard for what was important. Um, I like to lift weights, and it's one of the things that God put in my life, uh, I think it's 24 years, it could be 24 years ago today. It was February, I think it's 24 years ago today that I got saved. How funny. It's just a coincidence, right? Right? Just luck? No, God's... So I like to lift weights, and it's a discipline God put in my life, and I've done it for over 24 years. And, uh, you know, the, the weights that we lift now, we like to do bench press, and we like to deadlift, and we like to squat. And I would rather lift something heavy once than, like, a medium-range thing, like, ten times. Amen? You can nod your heads. Just a simple understanding. Yes. I would rather lift one heavy thing once... Then spend all day lifting a medium range thing 10 times. I'd rather just get it over with. So these bars that we use are 45 pound bars. 45 pound bar when you bench, 45 pound bar when you deadlift, 45 pound bar. Um, That is the standard that we were using. That's what I was told when I started years ago. And that's what all of my personal records are going off the fact that this bar is 45 pounds. And then whatever you add on top. Those are your personal records, and that's how you judge where your growth is. Now, I was told that since the day I started working out 24, maybe 30 years ago, and I believed it. So guess what we did last Sunday? We weighed the bars. Do you know that there's not one 45-pound bar in the place? Not one. Some are 43, some are 42, some are 47. Even these pro-competition bars that we use, that we use widespread, certainly these have to be 45 pounds. They're 43 and a third. My world was shattered. All of these personal records that I thought I had were all off. See, because I listened to what others told me as to what the standard was for those bars. And I never went and weighed the bars for myself. Therefore, when the truth came, it changed everything. Now let's translate that into today. How many of us are living a life where we have set a standard for ourselves as to what God wants for us? Think about this. And in reality, the truth of the matter is, is that the standard that God set is the Word of God. It is the single most important thing in your life today. If you are trying to do any of these other things apart from the Word of God, then it's what the Bible calls works. And is there any work that I can present to Jesus that can take the place of the Word of God? I used this example this morning in our Sunday school class. When Michelle and I built a house about 15, 16 years ago, they put in an air conditioner. And the builder, I'm sure, trying to save money, he put a unit in that if it worked at maximum capacity all the time, it could produce a minimum requirement in the house. Anybody dealt with that builder before? Lovely guy. (laughs) So what was happening to the air conditioner? That air conditioner, yes, it could produce to get the house to a certain temperature, but it had to work as hard as it could in order for it to get there. 
So how many air conditioners do you think we've replaced in our house by now? Two? Maybe three? Why is that? Because that air conditioner was never created to work at a maximum level. So as me as a believer, as part of a church, God did not create you to work at a maximum level to produce a minimum, a minimal effect. Amen. See, this is where grace comes in. See, when a diligent man hears the grace message, he gets more excited because he's like, Lord, look at, look at all what you've empowered me to do. There's grace for that. There's your grace. You're empowering me to do those things that I can't do. If I'm a soul winner now, I've been empowered by grace. How much more can I do? Lord, I'm a servant. If you're going to empower me to serve anymore, look how much more I can do. A lazy person hears the grace message and says, well, Jesus did everything he's going to do. Therefore, that's all I got. I don't want to do anything else. It's a completed work. Jesus has done everything he's going to do. Therefore, I don't need to do anything. Both are dangerous. Amen. We want to live somewhere between grace, I'm sorry, between love. Well, what's the best way of saying that? Somewhere between grace, well, truth and love. Truth and love. Too much truth. If somebody always wants to tell you the truth, the truth, the truth, you're not going to be around long. On the other hand, if you just love, 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 then we're not helping anybody either, are we? So we want to live right in the middle. Amen. Thank you, Lord. You can work your whole life, go to church, worship, pray, and serve, but those things were never created to take the place of your personal time in the Word of God. And I just want to tell you, church was never created for you to come and listen to somebody speak. It was created for you to come with what you had received in the Word, and when we have an explosion on a Sunday morning or a Tuesday night, because there's so much revelation in the room. Because you know what? If you'll notice this, that the Holy Spirit will have you on the same thing that some, that'll have somebody else on. And you're like, you know, I was just thinking the same thing. And the Holy Spirit will weave us all together where we're starting to get things so much quicker, where we're starting to get revelation knowledge because I'm spending my own time in the Word and now I'm more sensitive and I'm more open to what the Holy Spirit's saying instead of someone speaking and trying to pull everybody up to their level at that time. It's very, very hard to do on a Sunday morning service. Amen? Amen. Now, does that sound like works? No. Reading your Bible's fun. It's fun. Isn't it great? Do you love the Word of God? Do you have favorite scriptures? Yes? What were you doing when you found that scripture? Come on. There are certain scriptures that are precious and that they are dear to me. Amen? But what was fun was the, was the experience of finding it, of, of applying it, and of using it. Let's go to John chapter 15. I love John chapter 15. It's one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible. I'm going to begin in verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can you, except you abide in me. And I, uh, and I am the vine, and you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same that bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Abiding in God's word is not just sit around idly doing absolutely nothing. Amen? Also, abiding in his word is not working as hard as we can to try and produce some sort of a thing for God either. It's somewhere right in the middle. Abide basically means not to depart, not to leave, to continue to be present. The Word of God, and this is what's so important. If we call ourselves people of the Word, which we are, right? We're people of the Word. I don't go to the Bible like it's a vacation. It's a lifestyle. Amen. It's not just a place I go visit. It's not a place where I just go get a sermon when it's time to preach next Sunday. It needs to be something that I am living in on a continual basis. The Word of God needs to be something, and I'm a big fan of CDs, and I listen to teaching every single day, and I listen to all kinds of stuff every single day to help build up my faith. I have it in my car, I have it on my phone, I have it in my house. I listen to the Word every day, but even that cannot take the place of me sitting down with my Bible 
and going through the scriptures for myself and finding out what God's will is for me. Because faith can only begin for you where the will of God is known. That's so important to remember. I would dare to say a lot of us know some scriptures. But if it came down to it, do you really know? How do you know that God loves you? How do you know that God loves you? Where? What? Great. Is it God's will for me to be prosperous? How do you know? Where? First John. See, a lot of us know these things, but if you don't know where they are for yourself, see what happens when we get attacked in an area, is, and Michelle and I are like this, we'll start quoting scriptures, but you know, it's important to go back into the word and you need to see it for yourself. You need to see that word and you need to say it out loud so that your own ears can hear you. And you need to begin to take that word and you need to wield it like a sword. And you need to begin to hack away at that thing that's hacking at you. That's what the Word of God was created for. What's the first thing? Jesus is in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. And after that, the Bible says that he hungered. And Satan shows up, and the first thing Satan tempts Jesus in, he says, Jesus, if you're the Son of God, why don't you turn these stones into bread? And so Jesus, of course, did what he did, and he went and prayed. No? Oh, no, no, no. He called a prayer meeting. No, no, wait a minute. He worshiped. Wait. He, no, no, no. He went and looked for something that he could do for God to work for him. Right? He went and sang a worship song. He did a good deed. He said, it is written. And I want to encourage you that any area in your life where you are getting hit by the devil right now, You've got to get to the point where you can stand up in faith and say boldly, it is written. Now, Satan is a legalistic devil. He is, he is, he, he attacked Adam and Eve in the only law that was in place in the garden. There was only one law. Do not eat from this tree. So where did Satan attack them? The only place where there was a rule. Adam could have killed Eve and gotten away with it. There was no law covering that. Think about that. Where did Satan attack? The only place he can attack is where there was a law or where there was a rule. There was one rule in the garden. What was it? Don't eat of this tree. Where exactly did Satan pinpoint his attack? Right there. He is a legalistic God. So when you, not a God, but a spirit, when you stand up and you speak the word of God, it can't be like it was when Paul wrote, when they tried to cast demons out of the seven sons of Sceva, that God that Paul talks about. It can't be secondhand revelation because he doesn't move on secondhand revelation. But when a born-again believer, a child of God, stands up and points his finger back at, uh, at a force to them that seems so intimidating and says, it is written, it will drop Satan, it'll actually blow his head off. That's how much power that we have. What you have sitting in your laps right now is the single most powerful, explosive There is so much power in the Word of God in front of you right now, but unless we get into it individually and find out how that applies to me, and I'm a big fan of reading the Word, but what we want to take to the next level is, is now I want to start doing the Word. And when we start speaking and doing and applying the Word in every area of our life, then we're going to start seeing the full manifestation of everything that we're looking for. Amen? Uh, in John 15, 7, it says, If you live in me, which means if you abide vitally, united to me, and my words remain in you and continue to live in your hearts, ask whatever you will, and it shall be done for you. How many times have we read that? 
all the time. You ever wondered how that verse works? That's faith. That's exactly how your faith was created to work. If you don't have word, you don't have faith. And when we live and abide in the word of God and we begin to fill ourselves with the word of God, it's when we are filled with the word of God in a situation that we can stand up in faith and say to that mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea. See what I'm saying? It's the word of God. If you're wondering, well, Lord, why isn't my faith working in this area? Well, how, what's your word level in that area? Are we wishing or are we hoping? Come on. If I'm believing God for a car or I'm believing God for a loved one, do I have corresponding scriptures to what I'm believing? See, here's the funny thing about churches like ours. Churches like this were considered word of faith. Um, a lot of people get mad at the prosperity gospel. They get mad when they find out that God wants to heal you. They think we're some fly-by-night organization or groups that's only in it for the money or the prosperity, or for the blessing, and all those types of things. And I'm sure that there have been some people that have acted that way and led to that type of, a, but it's not all of us, amen? amen? Do you know the men that we have followed in the Word of God? The reason they believe what they believe and what we believe what we believe is because they have spent their lives in this book. These are not some fly-by-night trying to separate somebody from their money. The only way you can come to the revelation that it's God's will for you to prosper is to spend time in the Word. That's the kind of church that we are. You have been gifted with a lot of great teachers in this church. We're teachers by nature. Yes, there's some things that we need to do better. You know, we need to be better about our evangelism. We need to be better about in the community. Yes, we fully understand that. But what God has called us primarily to be and to do is to teach the Word of God. And to be honest with you, for a lot of people, it's kind of boring. I'm just going to be real honest with you. Woohoo, going to go and someone's going to teach me again today. I want to see something. I want to do something. I want pretty colors and bright lights. And I want all these things. And there is a time and a place for all those. But the reason that God has you in this place today is so that you can be taught how to live an overcoming life in the world outside those doors. And I don't know of anything else in the earth that we would not apply the same diligence to if you were going to be a lawyer or a doctor or whatever it is you were going to do. You would spend years and hours upon hours of educating yourself on how to be the best in your field that you could be. But when it comes to the Word of God, I'm not speaking to anybody in this church. I'm just saying, when it comes to the things of God, we're trying to sometimes get by on a bare minimum of a Sunday morning and a Tuesday night, and you give me a word, and you preach to me, and you teach me something. And in reality, the only way that you're ever going to get out of the situation you're in, the only way that you're ever really going to grow into the fullness of what God has called you to do, is when you begin to get into the Word of God for yourself. Every day. Every day. And what I would encourage you to do is you need to write scriptures down. And what I would encourage you to do is you need to memorize them. And what I would encourage you to do is you need to mutter them and speak them. And it needs to be the first thing that comes out of your mouth when any situation arises. It is written. I just got a bad report from the doctor. It is written written because in that first five minutes of any traumatic situation you have already decided your fate That's true. That's true. in that first few seconds when someone says you have cancer you got about 5 10 20 seconds to make your decision on what you're going to whether you're going to live or whether you're going to die because when you stand up and say it is written and you do not take ownership of all the evil thing that's going on in your life it's not your cancer it's not your diabetes it's not your blindness. It's not your depression. Why do we take ownership of things that we were never created to own? I didn't order this. This did not come in my salvation packet. Amen? I don't want it. 
I don't need it. It's not, it's not part, it's not. Do you know why it makes you feel so bad? Because your body was never created to carry those things. To walk around in pain for my whole life, thinking that I'm somehow holy. Have you noticed how the world has talked the blessing into the curse and the curse into the blessing? The poorer you are, the sicker you are, the lower you are. Look at Job. You ever read the last chapter in Job? When Job prayed for his friends and got back double everything that he lost? Yeah, let's go that Job route, Lord. Come on. This is not condemning this morning. I want to encourage us. I think that each and every one of us sees ourselves in a different place sometimes. We really do. Lord, why, why am I... I seem to be going around the same mountain every time. I seem to be dealing with the same situations over and over. Lord, I'm trying to forgive, but I'm not able to forgive. I'm trying to love, but I can't love. Until you can go into the Word of God for yourself and find out that there's no way that you're ever going to love until you know that He loves you first, it's never going to work. Any scripture you go into the Bible for and you try and access outside of God, it's totally flat, totally worthless. If you try and love outside of God's love, it's never going to work. You're going to be frustrated. If you try and forgive in your own flesh, it's never going to work. You've got to know that he went before you. He forgave you first so that you could come in and forgive after. See, he's given us everything that we need. He has fully equipped us and prepared us for everything now, this is a hard statement sometimes, but I'm really I'm getting the revelation of it. God has done everything that he's ever going to do for you. It's already done. It's already been done. Let me jump ahead a little bit. Proverbs 30, verse 5, and this is really where this whole study came from. And I'll finish with this. You getting something out of this? Yeah. Proverbs, my favorite book in the Bible. Somebody got it? Proverbs 30, verse 5? Uh, let me read it out of the Amplified. That's where I got this from. It says, every word, say every, every. word of God is tried and purified. He is a shield to those who take trust, who trust and take refuge in him. Every word of God is tried and purified. He is a shield to those who trust and take refuge in him. Who's he? I thought we were talking about the word. Every word of God is tried and purified. He? So the word and Jesus are the same. Does everybody understand that? This is my favorite part of this whole teaching this morning. Every word of God has been tested and tried. Have you ever seen the, the, the tire commercials or the, the infomercials where they will take their product and they will put it under the worst of circumstances? We'll put it under extreme heat. We'll put it in extreme cold. We'll put it under water. We'll leave it outside. We'll talk bad about it. We will do everything. We will put this product under the most extreme circumstances to show you that it'll still work. That's what God did with the word in the body of Jesus Christ when it went into hell. See, every word of God that we've used today has been tried and, and tested under the worst possible situation that there is. There's nothing in your life that can go deeper than when Jesus went into hell. There's no situation how horrible, how terrible, that the Word of God has not already gone not just to, but under. It's been purified. Every Word of God is tried before it even got put into the Bible. God took that word and he put it under the worst of circumstances and he pulled it out and it worked every single time. 
There is no sickness on your body that you can't be healed from. There's no depression that can stay on your body that you can't be healed from. There's no hole in your soul that was put there by someone else that can't be healed by that Word of God. Every Word of God has been tried and trusted. It's pure. It's pure. It's pure. It's pure. So whatever it is you need in your life, you need the Word of God. Amen? Amen? I like to pray for people. A lot of times what will happen is when we'll have our prayer ministers come, people will come down front, we'll pray for them, some of you will fall out, have a neat experience, get up and go, and, and sometimes there's been absolutely no change whatsoever. Because we look at coming down front and having somebody pray for you as the end of the situation, but in reality, it's just the beginning. Because what someone has done is they've added their power of agreement. You've now been energized, and it's up to you. It's up to you now to go back and get into the Word for yourself and begin to build yourself up in that area. That's when the change is going to come. Amen? It wasn't created for us to do everything for everybody. God created us for you individually. Amen? For you individually to get into the Word for yourself. To find out, do you even know what all the promises are? Are you sure? Are you lifting a 45-pound bar and you think it's 45 pounds? Because there's going to be a time when the, 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 a scale is coming, when we're going to be measured. But Lord, I thought the standard was this. Well, no, no, I thought the standard was this. And when the truth comes everything else is going to fall away. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's stand up. Hallelujah. The Word of God, like anything, is an acquired taste. Amen? When I was in the world, the first time I drank bourbon, I can't say that it was like drinking... Coke or something, amen? I mean, I, it was nasty. It burnt. It was terrible. I had to try really, really hard, and I did, <laughs> to acquire a taste for it, amen? If we have lived our whole lives living off of junk food and, 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 and those types of things, when you have to go back to eating broccoli, come on. It's hard sometimes. And I just want to encourage us, a lot of us have given, we, we, there's a lot of spiritual junk food out there. But I want to encourage you, when you get into the Bible, I'm not telling you that, that the, um, you know, there's, the lights aren't going to come on out of the pages and the angels are going to come sit with you at your feet. Amen? I read my Bible first thing in the morning and there's been many a times I'm like, I've just read the same verse ten times in a row and didn't even know it. Amen? So I'm not trying to teach you to be a super spiritual, super Christian. What I am encouraging you to do is to take a verse, take a chapter every day and ask the God, ask God, Lord, how does this apply to me? If you don't know where to start, start in the book of John. Amen. Greatest book in the Bible. Talks about love, talks about the Holy Spirit. It'll explain to you who Jesus is. But unless you are coming from the Word... Other areas in your life, you're going to be frustrated if you don't have a word base as to what you're doing. Amen? Amen. Grab hands with the person next to you. Hallelujah. Lord, thank you for the word. Say, thank you for the word. Do you know what he went through to get that book in your lap? Come on, man. He didn't. There is, like Pastor said, there's no plan B. There's no plan B. He gave his life for you to have those verses in your lap right now so that you could use that to get you out of any situation that you're in right now. Father, thank you for today. Lord, thank you for the word of God. Lord, thank you that we are a word church. That, Father, we put the word first place in every area of our life today. 
Father, I thank you that that children's department, Father, it's full of the Word of God. It's plastered on the walls. It's put in each and every room. It's taught to every kid. Father, this place you have set aside to be a place where people can be taught the Word of God so that they can overcome and so that they can find out and they can walk in the authority that you've called them to. Father, I thank you that there's healing in each and every person according to the Word of God. There's deliverance. And Lord, I'm asking for a, for a, a spiritual hunger for each and every one of us, Lord. Help us increase to make us more hungry, Lord, for the things of God. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen.